Hello, and welcome back to Chapter 13. Um, today we're going to talk about um, Section 13.2, which deals with the ideal gas law. However, before we do that, if you recall, back in Chapter 13, um, or Section 13.1, we talked about the combined gas law. And I don't want you to forget that. I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we're going through today's stuff. If you recall, the combined gas law was P1, V1, divided by T1 equals P2, V2, divided by T2. And don't forget that temperature, which is our T value, has to be given in Kelvin. So, and Kelvin, if you recall, is found by taking your degree Celsius and adding 273 to it. Let's first start out by looking at Avogadro's principle. Now, I know there's a lot of stuff written on this slide, okay? You don't have to write every single thing down. Just write down the key pieces. The one thing I want you to remember about Avogadro's principle is it says that when you have equal volumes of gases that are being held at the same temperature and pressure, they have equal numbers of particles. Okay, so equal volumes held at the same temperature and pressure tells us that we have the equal number of particles. So let's just think about this. If I have two bottles, let's say water bottles, okay, that don't have anything in them, and I put some helium gas into one bottle and carbon dioxide gas in the other, okay? Because I have the same bottle or the same volume, and they're going to both be sitting side by side at the same temperature, I might have five particles of helium in one. That means I'm also going to have five particles of carbon dioxide in the other. So it doesn't matter what type of a gas particle they are. If they're equal volumes that are held at the same temperature and same pressure, then I will have the exact same number of particles regardless of the gas that's inside. The next thing I want to look at is volume in moles. I know it's been a while, but if you remember, one mole is really equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power, okay? Thus, Avogadro's number, okay? We're going to use that um, as you'll see here in a few minutes in one of our examples. We also have molar volume. Now this is the volume that one mole will occupy when we're at zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere. And I know we talked about this when we talked about section 13.1, but whenever we have something at zero degrees Celsius in one atmosphere, this is known as standard temperature and pressure. And in your book and in your handouts and everything that you're, you'll see from this point forward, standard temperature and pressure is going to um, be written as STP, okay? And if you remember, zero degrees Celsius is really the same thing as 273 degrees Kelvin. So standard temperature and pressure is 273 degrees Kelvin and one atmosphere or zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. Um, Avogadro also discovered that one mole of any gas will occupy a volume of 22.4 liters at standard temperature and pressure. Okay, we can use this conversion that one mole is equal to 22.4 liters when we're trying to um, solve simple or certain types of problems and I'll show you that here in this little mini example. So our example says to find the moles in a sample of a gas that has a volume equal to 3.72 liters at standard temperature and pressure. So just like I would do with any other problem, I'm going to start out with what I've been given. I have 3.72 liters at standard temperature and pressure, which means I know that I have 273 degree Kelvin and one atmosphere. And if I want to convert this to moles, I know that I have one mole for every 22.4 liters. So to get my liters here to cancel out, I know that liters has to occur down here, and I want to look for moles in my numerator. So then I'm going to use this conversion factor that one mole equals 22.4. So I have one mole for every 22.4 liters. When I multiply my two fractions, I see that I get 0. 166 moles of this gas when I have 3.72 liters. Okay, example one says that we have 11.2 liters of an unknown gas at standard temperature and pressure 
and this has a mass of 22 grams. We want to find the molecular mass of the unknown gas. So to do this, again, we're going to start out with what we know. I have 11.2 liters, and I need to get to a mass. Well, I don't have a conversion that will take me directly from liters to mass, but I have something that will take me to something that will get me to mass. And if you recall, we can convert to moles because I know that one mole is equal to 22.4 liters. So I can convert this using my one mole for every 22.4 liters. And this is going to give me 0 0.5 moles. Now, I want to know what is the molecular mass of my unknown gas. Well, I know that molecular mass is equal to grams per mole. I'm given that I have 22 grams, and I just calculated how many moles I have. So if I take my 22 grams and divide it by my 0.5 moles, I'm now going to have units of grams per mole, which is what I'm looking for, and I'll have my molecular mass. So 22 divided by 0.5 should give you 44 grams per mole, or our molecular mass of our unknown gas. Now back in section 13.1, we talked about how we could combine Avogadro's principle along with the three laws to generate an equation that relates both or all three things of pressure, volume, and temperature. And this was our combined gas law, where we had P1V1 divided by T1 equals P2V2 divided by T2, or this right here. Now, because we know that volume and pressure are directly proportional to the number of moles, we can incorporate the combined gas law into what we call the ideal gas law. And the ideal gas law is given by PV equals nRT. So the two big equations that you have to know for this chapter is the combined gas law and now the ideal gas law, which is PV equals nRT. Our P still represents pressure, V still represents volume, N now is going to represent the number of moles. R is an ideal gas constant, which I'll show you the table here in just a second. There's a few different variable or values that you're going to use for R, and it's all going to depend on what units we're using. And then T is still temperature in Kelvin. This table of R values will be given to you on the test or quiz, but you can also find it on page 454 in your textbook. And what I want you to notice is I have three different values here and all the only thing that's going to the varies between these is the unit that I'm using for pressure. So if I have atmospheres, I'm going to use the 0 0.0821. If I'm given pressure in terms of kilopascals, I'm going to use 8.314. And if I'm using millimeters of mercury, I'm going to use the 62.4 value for my R value. So again, it all comes down to your unit of pressure. So let's look at an example that deals with this. It says determine the Kelvin temperature required for 0 0.014 moles of a gas to fill a balloon to 1.2 liters under a pressure of 0.988 atmospheres. Now I know that I have to use the ideal gas law because I'm given the number of moles. If I'm not given the number of moles, then I can probably use one of our other laws that we've um, talked about so far. But I'm going to use PV equals nRT. Because I'm solving specifically for my T variable here, I'm going to isolate T first, which means I'm going to have to divide by my N and R, so I end up with temperature is equal to pressure times volume, divided by N, which is your number of moles, times R, which is your um, ideal gas constant. So now all I have to do is I have to plug in my pressure, which we said was 0.988 atmospheres. And please keep your units. 
my volume was 1.2 liters. My N was 0 0.014 moles. And because my unit of pressure is atmospheres, that tells me I'm going to have to use the 0 0.0821. And your units on this are going to be liters times atmospheres divided by moles times Kelvin. And what this should do is it should cancel out with your remaining units there. So when I simplify all of this, you should see that you end up with 307 Kelvin for a temperature. Now if we wanted to know what that temperature was in degrees Celsius, I'm going to take that 307 and subtract 273 and I see that I end up with 34 degrees Celsius. The next thing we're going to look at is the ideal gas law, which is what I have as IGL, and our molar mass and density. Now if you think back to chapter 10, we talked about how the number of moles of a gas is really equal to the mass divided by the molar mass. So if I use my PV equals NRT equation, and let's look at this right here, and I know that we said N, which represents the number of moles, is equal to our mass, which is the lowercase m, divided by our molar mass, which is capital M, I can go ahead and take my ideal gas law, and which is PV equals NRT, so let's just write that up here, so I have PV equals NRT, and I can replace this N now with the lowercase m for mass divided by our molar mass, or capital M, and that's how I end up with this equation. Now, if I rearrange this equation and I solve for this capital M, you end up with a molar mass equaling the mass times the ideal gas constant R times your temperature in Kelvin divided by your pressure times your volume. This is something I will give you, oops, this equation right here, but you will have to know how to use it. The next thing we're going to look at is the ideal gas law and density. Now, way back at the beginning of the year when we talked about density, we talked about how density was equal to mass divided by volume. So if I take my um, previous equation where we had the molar mass, or capital M, and that was equal to the mass times the ideal gas constant R times temperature divided by pressure and volume, if I take my M and my V from there and replace that with a capital D for density, I now get that my molar mass is equal to density times my ideal gas constant R times my temperature in Kelvin divided by pressure, or this equation right here. So if we simplify and we um, go back and solve for D in terms of density, we then end up with density is equal to M for molar mass times your pressure divided by your ideal gas constant R times your temperature in Kelvin. And again, this is an equation that I will give you. You just have to know what everything means so that you can use it accordingly. Now, the ideal gas law is kind of um, it's kind of like in an ideal situation, okay? Thus the name ideal gases, okay? The difference between an ideal gas and a real gas, um, you have to think of when we're, when we're talking about ideal gas um, in this theoretical world, we are assuming um, that the kinetic molecular theory stuff applies. And if you remember from the last um, section when we talked about the kinetic molecular theory, we talked about how particles do not take up space, okay? that we're assuming that there's no intermolecular forces, that there's no attractions to the walls or the sides of the container that our gas is being contained in, and that our particles are going to be in constant random motion. Now, these assumptions are all assuming, too, that we are under standard temperature and pressure conditions. So if we have any variance to any of the above mentioned, then 
it's going to kind of skew our data a little bit. And I, you know, in real life or in reality, no gas is truly ideal because we know that our gas particles have volume. We know that there's going to be um, interactions between um, the containers and the other forces. Um, and not all of our collisions are going to be elastic. But these are just ideal assumptions that will get us pretty close to what we need to um, get to for calculation purposes. We also have a situation um, of extreme pressure and temperature. When you subdue your gas to an extreme pressure or an extreme temperature, um, this is definitely going to deviate from our ideal gas behaviors. Um, in some cases, when you actually put some gases under extreme pressure, they will actually liquefy. Um, so that definitely is going to change um, the behavior of the gas. And that's just one example, but there's just know that when you have extreme temperature and extreme pressures, ideal gas laws um, no longer will follow the ideal gas behaviors that we would anticipate. And last but not least, um, polarity and particle size will affect the ideal gas behaviors. Now, if you think about polar molecules, polar molecules mean that they have charges, okay? And if they are if they have these charges, like a positive charge or a negative charge, they're going to have a stronger attraction to other molecules. So if they have stronger attractions, they're going to be trying to pull these molecules towards them, which is kind of de going to deviate from our uh, ideal gas laws in the kinetic molecular theory where we said we're making the assumption that these molecules are not going to be interacting or not going to be attracted from each other. So polarity plays a key role in uh, deviating from the ideal gas laws. And then the larger particles, well, if I have a larger particle, they're going to take up more space or more volume. So if we're kind of assuming that there's not much volume going on under the kinetic molecular theory, and all of a sudden I'm going to go in and throw a, let's say, let's say the kinetic molecular theory is assuming that we're dealing with something like, like peas, and all of a sudden now I'm throwing in an apple or an orange, that's going to have a little bit more of an impact on my assumptions. So that's why larger particles will kind of deviate from our ideal gas laws as well. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to either look up some of this information on your own or I will be back on Monday. Good luck!